rise in spirit or body for the call to worship. We are gathered here, beloved community, to worship the one whose name is Prince of Peace and Light of the World, whose name is Strong and Mighty Tower, our refuge and our strength. We gather this morning to worship the one whose name is Life and Love, Messiah and Savior, whose name is Emmanuel, God with us, the Christ, whose name is the bright morning star, our champion and shield, whose name is our strength and our song, whose name is wonderful counselor, the living word, redeemer, anointed one, the holy one of Israel, good shepherd, rock of all ages, my hiding place, fortress, deliverer, our victory. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Beloved community, let us join our voices to sing the praises of Christ. Welcome to worship. You may be seated. This morning, we are so glad that you've joined us by a live stream or in the building here at, in the sanctuary at Hennepin. Welcome to all. There are welcome sheets in your bulletin and there is a welcome pad online. Please fill that out so we know that you've been in worship with us today. We want to serve you and know that you are with us today. I have a special treat for you today. Our district superintendent, Cynthia Williams, is here to lead our church conference immediately following the service at 1130, but she's also here to preach and to share the word of God with us today. Cynthia has just become our district superintendent. Many of you know Dan Johnson was our former district superintendent, but we're so happy to welcome you, Cynthia, to our district in the Twin Cities. We're glad that you're here. Cynthia has come from her, her media appointments before being a district superintendent, where 
work to be at Park Avenue and Camp for Memorial United Methodist Churches. We're glad that you're here with us today. Something you may not know about Cynthia Williams is that she is a wonderful painter. And so we have that kindred, we're kindred spirits in that way, Cynthia. And also she comes from the South. And so she has a special love for Southern cooking. And her specialty is peach cobbler, just so you know. Let's continue to worship now as we turn our hearts to God and lift them up to God as we sit in anticipation of what God is going to do in our hearts and spirits today. invite you to join me in the litany of forgiveness. Your responses will be on the screen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Yet we are so concerned about our own rights and self-interest, and so little concerned about serving others. Have mercy on us. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, you said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Yet we are impatient under our burdens and unconcerned about the burdens of others. Have mercy on us. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, you said, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall have their fill. Yet we do not thirst for you, the fountain of all holiness, and we are satisfied with hash, half measures and mediocrity. Have mercy on us. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, you said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Yet we are so quick to condemn, so slow to forgive. Have mercy on us. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, you said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. 
Yet we are so often ruthless for each other, and our homes and our world are so full of discord and resentments. Have mercy on us. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Please join me in a time of prayer and silent meditation. I invite you now to rise in body and spirit for assurance of forgiveness. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. I can invite all of the children to come forward at this time for our time with children. You can come right up here on the carpet. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Let's do our thumb check in. We haven't done that in a while. So I want to see from everyone if you're if we're doing good, it's a thumbs up. If we're meh, it's in the middle. If we're had a tough week, it might be like this. So let's see. A visual, everybody. Everybody means everybody. There we go. Okay. I'm seeing some double thumbs up, which is awesome. I'm seeing, I'm seeing answers that are all over the place. And you know what? That's okay. We don't all have to show up with double thumbs up. That feels good, and some days we'll have that. But some days we are going to show up, and it's going to be in the middle. And some days we're going to show up, and, oh, no, I see a double thumbs down. That's okay, too. Because God is here to meet with us no matter how we're feeling today. Now, today I want to talk about peace. So children, I always ask you some questions. Hey, Smith, how's it going? Great. I want to I hear from you guys. What do you think peace is? And what does peace feel like? Do any of you have an answer for, for what peace feels like? For you? Yes, Smith. <laughs> You're going to raise your hand and then say no? Happy place. That's good. A happy place where you just sort of feel <sighs> at ease. Is that what peace feels like for you? Margaret, what does peace feel like for you? She says nothing, and I think sometimes that might be true. When there's no chaos and things don't feel icky and hard and you just kind of feel ah, nothing. That could be what peace feels like. Ooh, she says, no little brothers running around and screaming their heads off. That, <laughs> that, that might be what peace feels like. In that moment, peace for your brothers could feel like running around screaming their heads off, though. We could be kind of at an at a opposition there. All right, let's do one more. Dylan, what does peace feel like for you? Everybody's saying yes to you, so no conflict. I agree. When there's no conflict, we can kind of feel at peace because when there's, con when there's conflict and we're disagreeing with each other, and sometimes when we're disagreeing and we're not being kind about it, because it's okay, we can disagree peacefully. But sometimes when we disagree and we're not being kind, that's not peaceful and that doesn't feel good, does it? No. Not at all. 
How many of us, and this is for the whole room, have been in a situation where we were uh, disagreeing with someone and then it kind of turned mean and we walked away kind of feeling icky inside and feeling like, oh, I didn't like how that went. I don't like how I feel about this person now and I don't like how I think they feel about me now. We've kind of all been there. Some of us were probably there at some point this week because that happens a lot. It does, because conflict is just part of our lives and we have to learn how to deal with conflict in a peaceful way. So did you guys know here at Hennepin, and I know that you know this, and some of you are very prepared for this today, but here in our church, we practice the passing of the peace every single week. Did you know that is one of the oldest Christian traditions? Like as old as the church. <sighs> Guys, I wasn't prepared for these questions today. They're asking me, how old is the church? <laughs> since, the, since after the resurrection of Jesus, when he sent his spirit and said to go and make disciples. <laughs> a couple thousand years ago. We're going to continue this conversation later. Back to, I'm getting badgered this morning. Okay, let's, let's, practice, let's practice some quiet peace. Okay, let's, 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 let's finish our, our children's time message, and you guys can badger me in the chapel. Sound good? Great. Okay, so the passing of the peace is one of the oldest Christian tra traditions, and it's important because the early church they were told to do everything in their power to live at peace with one another. And we know from the life of Christ and in being Christians that we are to be peacemakers in the world. So what does that look like to live at peace with one another? What do you think, Howard? Oh, he says, he says sleeping. He says living at peace is sleeping. I'm going to go ahead, since we're running out of time, and say that living at peace with one another means that maybe even in a disagreement or a conflict, we can show kindness and say, you know what, I appreciate your perspective. I don't agree, but I still love you, and I'm going to extend kindness, and we're going to continue to live in community together peacefully. Or when someone does something mean, it's saying, you know what, I forgive you. And especially when someone apologizes and they say, I'm sorry that I was mean to you, immediately saying, you know what, I forgive you. Let's continue to be friends and live at peace with one another. So when we pass the peace every week, we're reminding ourselves that we are to live as people who want to be reconciled, as people who want to extend forgiveness and grace and love in the world. And to see justice happen, because where there's justice, there is peace. So we're reminding, our, reminding one another that sometimes it could also be extending forgiveness to someone who sits in the pew next to you. Today, after service, there's going to be a vote. And anytime there's a vote, there are people who vote differently. And sometimes that can be difficult and there can be conflict and hard feelings, but that's why we pass the peace. Every week we remind ourselves as we say to each other and extend the peace, which I won't say it, the kids are gonna say it, but as we extend the peace of God to one another, we're reminding each other of that, of what it means to really live in our values as Christians, even when we have situations where we don't totally agree. I see lots of hands raised. We'll take questions in the chapel. We'll take questions in the chapel because now we're, we are going to stand up and I'm going to have all of you come, come up to the front as you can, as close as you can, and turn around and face the congregation because now you're going to lead them. Some of you were here last week to practice and some were not. That's okay. So... On the count of three, we're going to say, hold on, everyone, give us a moment. May the peace of God be with you. 
You can all stand up uh, as you are able in spirit and in body um, and share the peace of God as the children and I head to the chapel where I will be badgered some more. Scripture reading comes from Matthew 17, verses 1 to 9. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself, alone. And and as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Good morning. How beautiful it is to be here today in this holy, sacred space. And I am so grateful that who knew that the Lord would guide me back to my home district, the Twin Cities. And so, it, and Judy used to be my superintendent. <laughs> so it's kind of full circle. And so it is just with joy that I greet you this morning and I stand before you. And I also bring greetings from our new bishop, Bishop Lynette Plambeck. Um, when you meet her, you will be as delighted as I am. She is, she is just a breath of fresh air. And so this morning... Um, My sermon title, actually, Laura, I'm sorry, it's actually a God's eye view. I changed it. Uh, And I'm so grateful to be here on, this is also Transfiguration Sunday. But let us pray. And so, God, we come before you this day. And, Lord, we know that you know us. And, Lord, you have ordered our steps. You have guided us to this place. We're so grateful that your provision is found at our point of need. We are your people, and we're listening. And so we simply ask that you would speak. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock, you are our strength, and you are our redeemer. And the people of God said, amen, amen. How many of you have had the experience of going up to a mountain? Many of us, right? How about you call out some of the mountains you've ascended? All right. Kilimanjaro, anybody? (laughs) Been in the Alps? There is this sense of excitement and anticipation and thrill and adventure that draws us up. And as we ascend, it seems the issues, the worries, the concerns of life slowly fade into the background. And whether climbing on foot or driving up, the effort to uh, go up becomes greater and greater and it requires an attentiveness that causes us to stay present in the moment. And when you make it to the top, the effort is well worth it. There's something about being up there and being able to stand present, to look back and to look ahead on the mountaintop, 
on the mountaintop, we experience a fresh perspective. I'm reminded of a story that Tommy Tenney, a preacher, tells about his three-year-old daughter. He shares a story about how they got on an elevator one day in a hotel. And at first, it was only the two of them. But as the elevator stopped on each floor, more and more people got on. And as they continued to get on, his daughter slid a little closer to him. And as the elevator filled with people, she pressed into him. And she stretched up her arms and she said, pick me up, Daddy. I can't see from down here. <laughs> the issues and the questions of life can crowd in on us. They tend to overwhelm and to block and distort our view. And sometimes we're like that little girl and we need to cry out, pick me up, God. I can't see from down here. Russia's assault on Ukraine enters its second year. Over 40,000 have lost their lives in Syria and Turkey, and the senseless gun violence and the mass shootings in public square leaves us numb, and I don't know about you, sometimes for a loss of words. It is sobering, and it is tragic. And I don't need to run down the litany of how our communities are pressed on every side. We carry these different levels of trauma in our very being. But as Christ followers, despair can never have the last word. And so we say, pick us up, Lord. We can't see from down here. Please give us a God's eye view. In today's text, the disciples are starting to see that the bloom of following Jesus has come off the rose. The crowd witnessed the baptism of Jesus and heard the voice of God claiming Jesus as God's beloved son. Jesus has been going around villages, delivering folk from demons, healing and setting people free. Jesus has shown himself as a one-man second harvest, feeding thousands with a few fish and a few loaves. But there's this shift in momentum. John the Baptist, the one who paved the way for Jesus, has been arrested and beheaded. And now Jesus is beginning to talk about his own impending doom. He tells his disciples he will be killed and will rise on the third day. And then Jesus says something even more perplexing. Jesus says if anyone wants to be his disciple, they must embrace suffering and not run from it. They must embrace discomfort. They must be willing to lose that which they hold most dear if they want to live the life that God has for them. And for the disciples, this is crazy talk. <laughs> is this what they signed up for? How do you reconcile this message of gloom and sacrifice with this being the year of the Lord's favor? What happened to captives being set free? Lambs lying down with lions, the lame leaping for joy. What happened to turning ashes of mourning into garments of praise? You can imagine Peter, James, and John having a pick-me-up, Rabbi. I can't see from down here. Six days after they hear these hard words from Jesus, he leads the three up to the mountain. Peter the rock upon which Jesus will build the church. James, the first of the 12 eyewitnesses to die for Christ. And John, the last survivor and eyewitness to his glory as told in the revelation. Jesus takes them up to the mountain to give them a fresh perspective to clarify and prepare and strengthen them to come back down and walk through the valley up ahead. In the valley, our perspective is often very narrow. It's the place where we tend to live in our own heads, to lean to our own understanding. This is the place where we limit ourselves to what we've been told, to how it's supposed to be, in the way it's always been done. Theologian Tom Long states that on the mountain, what is transfigured is our perception of Jesus, and our perception of ourselves. In the valley, we could have never guessed that Jesus is beloved by anyone. 
He's been misunderstood by the disciples, rejected by his hometown, up against a brick wall of unbelief, and plotted against by the authorities. Jesus beloved? Hardly. Peter, James, and John in the valley saw Jesus as a rabbi doing some miraculous deeds. But on the mountain, on the mountain they see Jesus in his glory, totally transformed, a pre-resurrection view, God in flesh, and God divine. On the mountain, while at the time they couldn't fully understand it, Jesus is revealed as the fulfillment of the law as given to Moses and in Elijah, the fulfillment of prophecy. In the ordinariness of life, we are shaped and defined by our experiences, by what we do and what we've done, by who people prescribe us to be. But when we get a God's eye view, we see who we truly are. We are beloved. We are called. We are chosen. We are claimed. And we are named. On the mountain, God gives us a glimpse of who we yet shall be. And not that we've attained, but on the mountain, we get strength to press on and to hang in there. In the valley, it seems that there are all these edges and hedges, light that hems us in on every side. But with a God's eye view, anybody that had a God's eye view lately, you can talk to me this morning. Have you had a God's eye view this week? When we have a God's eye view, we are lifted beyond our present circumstances, and we find that this moment, whatever it is we're going through, we find that it is but a blip in the overall story of our lives. Jesus stood between Galilee and Jerusalem. He stood at the crossroads of his ministry and his mission. Jesus on the mountain reaches out in the middle of our fears, our desperation, and our need. Jesus on the mountaintop meets us at the crossroads of our lives because the truth is we're always standing at some type of intersection and in that intersection we're always wondering what will come next what is before us we ask again who are you God who are you Jesus who are you really we've asked through the pandemic God what are you up to in our lives where are you in the midst of it all and we say and who are we who are we now on the other side and on the mountain we hear this essential response. This is my son. Listen to him. This is my son in the intersections and at the crossroads. Life has more questions than answers. And I tell you, it is solved by walking. It is solved by walking one foot in front of the other because we live life seeing through a glass dimly. But I tell you today what I know for myself, and I hope you hear, that we never forget in the valley what God has said to us on the mountaintop. Never forget what God has said to you when you are most clear about who you are and who God is and who we are with God. Like Peter, as much as we would like to pitch a tent and remain on the mountain, the reality is that life draws us back down. Sunday worship, and I love Sunday worship. Sunday worship is a mountaintop experience that renews and strengthens us, if we let it. This gathering today, virtually and in person, it is simply bread for the journey. It is not where we live. We come into this place to get built up so that we would go back out. Because the truth of the transfiguration is that it is not a story of staying up. Jesus could have stayed up there. The good news today is that Jesus came back down. Down. Jesus came down into the mundane nature of everyday life. Jesus came down into the nitty-gritty details of misunderstandings and squabbling and disbelieving disciples. Jesus came down into the religious and political quarrels of the day. Are you not glad that Jesus came down in the midst of whatever's happening in Congress, whatever is happening in Washington? I'm so glad that Jesus came back down today. He came down into poverty and into the pain of this world. 
This is not a story about going up. It is a story about Jesus coming down, all the way down into our brokenness and our fear and our disappointment and our losses. The good news is that Jesus came down and went to and through the cross and took on all that is hard and difficult and despicable in life. Jesus took it all on in order to wrestle victory from death that we might live life in a hope that nothing, that no height, nor death, nor things past, nor things present, nor things to come could ever separate us from the love of God who is with us and who is for us. This is good news today. Glory came down that we would have a future filled with hope, a life full and life abundant. Glory came down so that we would know Jesus and we would know how deep is God's love and we wouldn't just know it for ourselves, but we would know it so deeply that we couldn't help but tell someone else. Glory came down so that no trouble, no hard times, no hatred, no hunger, nor homelessness, no backstabbing, no bullying threats could get between us and God. Glory came down. Glory came down and went all the way to the cross and through the cross into death and out of death, hallelujah, and rose on the third day that we can now come boldly before God with a blessed assurance that absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing living, nothing dead, nothing angelic, nor demonic, nothing today or tomorrow, nothing high or low, no power or principality, nothing thinkable or unthinkable can ever, 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 ever get between us and God's great and amazing and merciful and everlasting love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Glory to God today. Hallelujah and amen. 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 Good job. Well, I think there's been a God sighting right here. Just saying. Every week on Tuesdays, our program staff and our director level staff gathers in the Longfellow room and we talk about ministry. And I always ask this question, where have you seen God this week at Hennepin? Because it's so easy to forget and get wrapped up in our tasks of ministry and getting things on the calendar and making sure that everything, all the dots, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and things run smoothly. But we had some God sightings because God is at work in this place, as you know, this past week, our staff has been talking about how God has been moving in the lives of some of our teens who are really experiencing something new as they sit in confirmation with Keisha Sedgwick. There's an excitement and a yearning and a hunger for knowing more about this guy named Jesus. And there's been God sighted in that place. A week ago, we met with the president of Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, one of our United Methodist partners. They're located in Evanston on the campus of Northwestern University. I've been on the board of trustees there for some years, and Garrett has reached out to us and said, we would like to be in partnership with Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. We like to set up a learning hub here at Hennepin so we can learn what it's like to be in ministry because sometimes we get up on the mountain of academia and we forget what God is doing in the church, in the local church, on the ground, on the front lines. And so Garrett has come to us and said, could we be in partnership with you and center our Center for Ecological Regeneration here at Hennepin? We're working out the details, but there's been a God sighting in that meeting as our core team from Hennepin met and started to dream and explore and imagine what God might be doing in this conversation and in our future together with Garrett Seminary. I saw God 
when we started planning and we went to the strategic council and we said, you know what, I think we should maybe work with somebody from outside of Hennepin who might have some fresh eyes to come in and say, what could we be about as a church for the 21st century as we do things in new ways because we are a post-COVID church? What does it mean to be a church in this time? And so we decided that we would, we would enter into a contract with Convergence. Not Converge, Convergence. It used to be called the Center for Progressive Spirituality. And we have been assigned a consultant who will come and work with us for 12 to 18 months with coaching to help us to dream a new future. And we'll be starting that new process. And then as your new senior pastor comes at the end of June, you will be able to pick up and move into a river of change that will come with God leading it. It's an exciting time to be at Hennepin. It is an exciting time to stand on the mountain and let, be led down into the valleys of, the, of poverty and into the work that we are called to do as we've always been called to do. It is an exciting time. Keisha is, is gathering up all the parents of the youth and the children on April 23rd to re-envision our children's ministry and children's music ministry and how we will minister to children and youth. It's an exciting time. Now, I know you don't need two sermons this morning. <laughs> but I want to tell you this. All of the dreams that we might have that God has planted in our hearts, all the God sightings that are around in this place, inside of this building and out in our neighborhood, of which we are invited to be a part of, which we will vote on today, none of that can happen unless each one of us says in our own hearts, I am ready to follow you down the mountain. I am ready to go where you lead me, God. We have to put our hearts there, friends. And we have to put our finances there as well. And so as you ponder this morning what you're going to give, let our offering be a sign of our faith. Let our giving be a sign that we are in with God and willing to look in new ways of being a congregation. Let our offering be a sign of our faith and trust in God's leading as we give our offerings with hearts that are full and ready to be led into an exciting new future. Our ushers will move among us now to receive our offerings as we give them from generous and grateful hearts. May we, all of us, find joy in our giving, for we are building a future with God. Amen? Amen. Let us give with joy.
God of steadfast love, your generosity knows no bounds. For the abundant gifts in our lives, we thank you. For the peace that passes all understanding, we praise you. For keeping our hearts and our minds on Jesus, we honor you. So receive the gifts we bring to you this day and help us stay focused. Stay focused on the things that are excellent, holy, just, righteous, and pure. Amen. Please be seated. Let us prepare our hearts to pray. Let's come to God this morning in an openness to God's spirit. As you come to God, we pray for those who are in the hospital. Ann Peterson is at North Memorial. I think she's home now in rehab. Keep her in your prayers. And we continue to pray uh, for those who are battling illness and uh, sorrows. We lift up those our siblings that we have in Tur Turkey and Syria. And don't forget to continue to pray for the students and faculty at Harding High School in St. Paul. Let us come to God now in a time of prayer as we settle ourselves and listen for the Spirit. Oh God of all seasons and settings in our lives, sometimes our doubts and cynicism close down like a fog and you seem so far removed leaving us vexed and lost. But then the music rises and the rains fall and the snow comes and the rainbows slather on puddles and babies giggle and someone stands up for justice and the daily composes its own poetry and the fog lifts among our spirits and our dreams come into view for they are your dreams. And we see all again again that it's all a gift from you. And our eyes glisten and our voices lift in praise to you. Oh God of all creatures and contexts in your creation, sometimes we can feel so alone, isolated, cut off of little consequence, and we find no trace at all of your presence. But, but then friend calls. An email comes into our email box, and a neighbor knocks, a child visits, and your love becomes a word made flesh again, and we remember. So we sense once more that all of life is a gift, and life becomes a we again, and an hour is in an us, and the you and of yours of it is real again. as your reign is resonant in our midst. Thank you. O oh God of healing and power, sometimes we feel exhausted and defeated, used up and ready to give up, and you seem altogether elsewhere and indifferent. But then a child looks up at us, through bottomless eyes and asks the forever question demanding an honest for now answer and all oh, somehow tremors up our spines and le levers our minds and we know anew what this life is all about. It is about you and your love and hope revived and not giving in to temptation but being delivered from evil and the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and that love Thank you, never ends. Oh God of patience and peace, more than sometimes we get damnably busy and enchanted with our busy schedules, overreaching and insensitive, vain and irritable, careless of all save paddling on the rapids of our preoccupation and ambition while being increasingly terrorized by whirlpools of emptiness and regret and loneliness, feeling as if you have abandoned us to our own fretful devices. But then there comes a chance to change 
bursts that change in the flash of a cardinal in the corner of our eye, floats in like the peach pink lips of a pucker up day like this, snuggles against us in beds, tickles us in a joke on ourselves, echoes in an adversity who criticizes us accurately, confronts us in an exploited person's just challenge, and yet the world swells with possibilities again. Beauty brims over from its source. The universe asks to be noticed. And grace teems around us like new galaxies. The first wave comes singing into our hearts. Sets that singing in our own songs, in the showers, in boardrooms, in voting booths and malls. And compassion comes in on the second wave and courage on the third, and commitment on the fourth. And you, and peace in all of them. And so we gathered this day, up on the mountaintop of worship, knowing we must go down into the valleys to face the realities of life, but we do not go alone. And so we give thanks for life, for joy, for hope, for love, as we put our trust in you and pray the prayer you taught us. Our God, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In this holy place, we make lots of decisions. And we pray that they are spirit-led. Today, we will have a church conference following worship, and we will discern together the movement of the Spirit of God for this church. We have an opportunity to give some of the funds from our Koinonia Retreat Center sale to Beacon Interfaith, Bridges for Youth, and Vision, and to give some funds back to our trustees to care for our building. We will vote on those perspectives, those opportunities that the Strategic Council has put forth to the congregation as their recommendation for how we might invest the money from the Koinonia Retreat Center into fruitful ministry. If you are a member, you are invited to stay at 1130, or you can join us online by Zoom. You will need to stop your live stream and go out and then enter in on Zoom. Those are two different platforms. You will not be able to vote from the live stream link. So if you are at home right now or some other place in the world joining us, make sure you go out of the live stream and come back in on Zoom so that you can participate fully in this hybrid conference. That will start at 11.30 here in the sanctuary. You will have time to go and pick up your donut and your coffee, chat a little bit, use the restroom, and then come back into the sanctuary for our church conference, which will be led by Cynthia Williams. We are also very excited to announce today that Keisha will be leading a vision team trip to, with Common Hope to Guatemala in August, and it's an intergenerational trip, so anyone of any age can go. If you are interested in knowing more about that and to find out if God is leading you to that trip, there will be an information meeting on February 23rd at 6 p.m., and it will be on Zoom. The link will be on the event page on our website, so check it out. The meeting will be recorded and made available after the fact so if you're not able to come at that time you can still uh, get information and be a part of that the trip is open to 10 to 15 people but we think we probably could have two or three teams so we'll, let's see what happens and um, that's February 23rd at 6 p.m. on zoom and then finally we are beginning the season of Lent on Wednesday it is Ash Wednesday and of course as is our tradition we will have an Ash Wednesday service here at Hennepin and it will not be live 
streamed. Unfortunately, we are going to be down in the Koinonia Hall, and we are, don't have the technology yet to do the live streaming down there. But do come to the church and join us, for we are going to gather round tables in an informal sign of, kind of setting, and we are going to mark the beginning of Lent as we begin a new and fabulous journey with God in these next six weeks, which will lead us to the season of Easter. Children are very welcome to join us for this uh, Ash Wednesday time together, so anyone of all ages are welcome. Let us now rise in body and spirit and let us join our hearts and voices together as we sing our hymn. Brothers and sisters, we are called to be the church for just such a time as this. We are called to go and be servants of Christ in the world wherever God leads us. And so, let us go from this place, knowing that we are created by a loving God who will never leave us, knowing that God has sent Jesus to walk with us, the Spirit of Christ who flows into us so that we can be the church that is on fire. Let us go from this place with hope, with resolve, with courage, and with peace. May the peace of Christ be with you all until we meet again. Amen. <laughs>